I'm never going to be of the opinion that somebody should be afforded an opportunity because of the colour of their skin. As long as we have the white British face, the male face, the 60 year old plus face, um, governing how this country um, runs and governing how um, football and sports runs within, within, within England, the results are always going to be the same. And the answer is staring at you dead in the face. But nobody wants to create a process to allow that solution to, to have its impact. It became the thing rather than the thing that invokes the conversation to provoke some change. Where does the love for football come from? Um, I suppose it comes from my upbringing. So my dad was my football coach growing up. Um, but prior to him becoming my football coach, it was just the influences. So him always watching football, playing football. Um, my brother was an avid and um, is an avid Man United fan. Um, so having just being exposed to football um, was was always a, a thing that was um, that was in my environment. But also I'd, I'd always class myself as a natural athlete. So just being in the playground and just happen to naturally be good at football, and then knowing that it's something that my brother and my dad. Had, um, had had such an avid interest in for me, it just paired the two together. So I started playing for about, from when I was about six or seven years old. Um, I started off, my very first gig was at Arsenal Soccer School. Um, and then I got one, like, one of the MVP awards and ended up playing at Highbury for a day. So that just opened up my eyes to just, just football world in general from then it started with my grassroots club, etc. So um, it just comes from influence and then influence comes from what you just naturally done in the playground. My story is so common to everybody else's. So. For your parents and your brother, very influential on, very on your career? Very influential. So my dad started to started coaching me when I was 11 years old. Um, when you come from a, a single parent household, it's um, often that you'll find you pair um, hobbies with, with your parents. So if, with me and my dad, it was our way of bonding because we didn't live together. Um, so football for me was just a way of expressing myself and doing what I love but also spending time with my dad. Um, so again, it was just killing so many birds with one stone for me, which is so convenient growing up. So talk to me about the process then. So grassroots club yeah, yeah. and then your journey into the world that you've got now. Yeah. So how did that happen? How did that become apparent? Um, so it's a funny story. So my, my dad was my coach and I remember one time we drove to Fulham's training ground and he said, oh, I just need you, need you to follow me there um, because um, they want to offer me a part time part time coaching role. So just follow me there and just do it so we can just see the facilities. And I remember we sat down um, after um, they took us on a tour, showed us the training ground, the, the catering, all that stuff. And then he sat me down after and he's like, right, I told you a bit of a lie. It was just you they wanted, not me. What do you want to do? And that was like a it was like 10 seconds, it, but it felt like an hour of just, all right, what's the next move going to be? And I remember I told him, no, I don't want to do it. And the reasons why, regretfully, um, is because I remember there was one individual who joined our grassroots club on a Sunday and he'd played academy football all his life. Um, and his debut match for us, I remember this vividly, he was about 12 years old. Um, he stood in the middle of the pitch and he just started to cry. And he looked at my dad, my dad's name's Trevor, he said, Trevor, I can't, can you take me off? I can't, I can't handle it. And then we it came to our attention that the pace, the, the social elements, the aggressiveness that you find with natural Sunday league football, he couldn't handle it because he'd come from a, an environment that was so cuddled and so pristine and the, the, the surface was like carpet and he came to us on a Sunday, there's potholes everywhere, there's mud and stuff and it's aggressive, high speed and it was overwhelming for him. Mm. And I remember looking at his reaction and I was like, if that's what he's come from and that's on the other side, I don't, I don't want that for myself. I'd rather just turn up on a Sunday and a Saturday and play with my friends. I'm having the time of my life. And that's the decision that I made. Um, so I turned on that decision, which I do regret now at, at 12, 13 years old. And then um, as time goes on, you, you realize that the dream that you thought you was pursuing becomes more and more less of a reality. Um, so 16 years old, um, I got my first coaching for qualification and then from then on serving my community and using coaching as a tool became um, my reality, my, my day to day, um, which ultimately contributed to where I am now. So it was that transition away from playing at a very young age. I didn't hold on to the dream till I was 21, 22 years old. From when I was 15, 16, I called it quits, put my efforts into something else and here I am. You mentioned community. Yeah. How important is community within football? Everything everything there <laughs> when community stops everything stops um and that's one thing that community don't realize is that the power's in your hands um 
Again, my dad was a community activist. He, he used football as a tool to reach communities in what we call as deprived areas. So I've always understood the necessity, the necessity of, of serving your community, um, but also the importance and the role that it plays in the conveyor belt within football. So point blank, the answer to me is everything. It starts with community and it ends with community um, because it starts with the players come from the community, but the fans are the community. When the fans stop, stop turning up, as we've seen at COVID, the clubs are impacted. And when the clubs are impacted, nothing else functions. So it starts here and it ends here. Do you ever see a frustration from seeing the extreme wealth at the top and how that's filtered down to community? Do you ever, is there a ever a frustration there being the role that you're in? Yeah, it's probably the most frustrating aspect because the answer is so simple. You've got so many resources at the top just make sure that it falls down to the bottom. Um, and there's so many potholes, so many um, nuances as to why that doesn't happen. Um, and it's, it's, it's probably the most frustrating thing when you have a problem and the answer is staring at you dead in the face, but nobody wants to create a process to allow that solution to, to have its impact. Um, and that for me is the most frustrating part is you have professional clubs, the professional clubs rely on the, the grassroots clubs to, to get their players. Um, just allow the resources to filter through. But unfortunately, that's not the way the system is set up. So yeah, the most frust that's the most frust frustrating part of my position. Um, so from a personal perspective, I come from a lower income, what they class as a lower income area. Um, so I make sure that the football that I provide is affordable. That, that simply um, addresses the, the issue of lower income, lower income households. Um, I come from an environment where um, we deem it as gang violence. So I use um, football as a tool to um, communicate. It's a mutual um, language. So I use football as a tool to make sure that different people from different areas can communicate with each other. Um, we have a high obesity rate within where I come from. So I use football as a tool to address the physical education. So it's different themes um, of different problems. Football can address every single one of those problems if it's used correctly. Um, it's just unfortunate enough to be raised in this environment to know how to use football to address each and every one of those issues. Um, but I always say if you've got an issue with Mr. society, football can answer that issue. So in terms of your, your role as grassroots manager, yeah. um, and obviously kick it out are very mm. much part of that, why are there, where do the issues lie within grassroots football in terms of discrimination? A very bold question. Yeah. Where yeah. do the issues lie? So <clears throat> if we're looking at the football pyramid, um, you have the pro game at the top, you have um, the academy sector in the middle and you have grassroots at the very bottom. Obviously with the structure of a pyramid, the bottom is the most populated, it's the largest part of the pyramid. Um, grassroots football is probably the most ungoverned part of the football pyramid because of its mass, because of the population. Um, and unfortunately in terms of supply and demand, Football cannot, as it currently stands, keep up with that supply and demand. So with my role as grassroots manager, I kick it out. It's understanding that there needs to be, number one, a major increase in resources. For some reason, when we talk about EDI, when we talk about discrimination, when we talk about inclusion, um, all of a sudden we don't have the budget for it or the money's not available. But if we're talking about eradicating these issues from society, this should be the most resourced area within football. And unfortunately, it's the opposite. So when we're talking about individuals, um, not just from a stance of race, it could be homophobia, it could be gender, it could be faith, um, it could be dis disability, which is, isn't talked about enough. Um, there's so many aspects within the grassroots sector that just isn't catered for because the resources aren't there. Um, so my personal role is to make sure I bring that reality to the boardrooms. When I meet with DFA, when I meet with county FAs, when I meet with local authorities, this is what the issues are. And these are the issues that have been there for years upon years. How can we bridge the gap to make sure that, not that we don't have the answer for it, but we can ease, start to address the issues head on so that generations coming after us can reap the benefits from it. As it stands, we haven't consistently put motion um, into action, um, sorry, action into motion to um, start to address the issues, but consistently. The same way that uh, my, my, my grandparents and my parents' um, generations were, were exposed to racism through football was the same way that I was. I was racially abused for the first time when I was 12 years old on a football pitch. My dad had the same issue. Um, so we have to get to a point where we start breaking what I call these generational curses and start facing issues head on. 
hopefully my role could be again just being um, an accurate depiction of the needs of the community and bringing that to the boardrooms which is where the decisions are made. Is there symmetry with other sports? Are other sports having a by similar far. similar issues or by far, yeah? By far, I always say discrimination is discrimination. No matter what, um, how you want to dress it, um, you can put different clothes on me. Tejan Hutton is always going to be Tejan Hutton, but I just my appearance may be different. I can put on a suit tomorrow. Somebody may deem me as an upper class business person. I'm dressed the way I'm now. Somebody will class me as an average middle class person because of my dressing doesn't mean that who I am on the inside has changed. Um, so the, the root of the issue is always going to be the same. It just manifests differently um, in accordance to which sport we're referring to. Key point that you mentioned, you mentioned resources yeah. and, and tackling the issue. That's those social issues. You mentioned racism, but a wide, different, uh, a wide um, branch of equality issues mm. that you kind of touched upon. Why is there limited resources put into those areas? <clears throat> I say there's a few reasons as to why. Um, one of the main reasons that I've observed over the past few years is because there's a lack of individuals in influential positions um, who have the influence to influence policy, to approve funding, to approve resources, um, to expand reach. Those individuals don't necessarily come from where we come from, which is the grassroots sector. If you were to go to any corporate organisation around the country that governs football or has a major stake in contributing to the development of football, and go to their executive levels or the director's levels and ask them how many of them have actually had experiences in grassroots level, the answer will be probably far few in between. Um, I always say empathy can only take you so far. Um, if I was to speak to a, a female um, who's involved in football, my understanding of a female experience can only take me to a particular limit because I'm not a female. You have to have the lived experiences. So when we're talking about um, addressing these issues and making sure that there's adequate resources um, um, to, to, to help have an impact in these areas, it can only come with influential pe people have the, have the experience or a high amount of empathy to understand the need. In my opinion, that doesn't currently exist. Um, and when it doesn't exist, what you're relying on is either data, which often isn't necessarily accurate, or you're relying on um, people to try and be empathetic, which again, to be empathetic to the point where it's accurate means you need to spend a lot of time understanding people's experiences. Um, and neither of those things are currently in place, um, which inevitably results into a dictatorship. We think this is what the people want, so let's just give them this, which is so far removed from what the people actually need. Um, so again, it's just having the right people in the right position. Is that a frustration for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a frustration for me on so many levels because um, people who look like me won't see a, a, a necessity or won't see an opportunity, not a necessity because they understand the needs. They won't um, necessarily feel they will get anywhere trying to apply for those positions um, because historically we can't prove what institutional racism or discrimination looks like but we know it exists. Um, and until we can prove it from a tangible perspective, nothing will really change. Um, so if a position opens up, somebody who either looks like me or somebody from any other underrepresented group um, sees that position and they'll be reluctant to because as far as they're concerned, the position, the position isn't designed for them, neither will it give them a fair chance. That's something we need to address separately. What kind of things occur within the grassroots sector? Um, one of the common themes is, is there's an inconsistency with how discrimination is handled within this country. Um, I know it's something that the FA, because again, we've, we're, we're trying to support them the best way that we can, and so, as part of supporting is challenging. Um, we're trying to support the FA and county FA the best way that we can to let them understand um, some of their shortfalls, um, some of the things that they, they've been be doing that may um, limit their impact. That's going to come with time. We're talking about decades upon decades of continuous um, and I'd call it mediocre impact. Um, that's going to take years to undo. Um, so it, number one, it's the way in which discrimination is handled is probably one of the most inconsistent things within this country. Um, the reasons why is because county FAs who govern f local football around this country, they're franchised, um, which a lot of people don't know. So the ideolo ideologies that you'll find where we are in Manchester may be completely different to London, which may be completely different to Northumberland up north. Um, because it's all down to the, the, 
the, the, the moral compass of the CEO, which will then create the culture that will filter down to each member of staff. Um, you can't manage that because again, there's, there's 50 county up to around 50 county phase around the country. There's 50 completely different organizations mm -hmm. with 50 completely ways of doing things. Um, and when things become unmanageable at that point, the, um, the resources, um, the attention that you give to these, these, these subject points will be completely different. At that point, in my opinion, we've, um, we've lost complete control, um, which we're steadily trying to regain control of um, as a collaborative effort. But as it stands, and I say this, and I've been saying this for years because it's my experience, it's the experience of those who come before me, um, it's a war zone in grassroots football right now. Um, because again, the governance is just very inconsistent. Um, and when you have inconsistencies, you have people taking matters into their own hands. Um, and that's where the war zone comes from. Um, so the governance is one side of things. Number two is obviously the resources. We need resources to, to make sure there's manpower or, or human power, sorry, um, to make sure that it's governed properly. Um, and then third is education. It's very hard to populate the bottom of the pyramid because there's so many people. Um, but again, that's where the resources come in. If we have a large array of individuals participating in grassroots football, it means we need a large pool of educators, as it stands, that doesn't exist. Between myself um, and my team, um, we delivered over 120 workshops last year. That still doesn't even scratch the surface. Um, so we know there's so much work to do, but there's only so, so much that one company or a, a group of individuals can do. Um, so those are the three things I probably highlight as one of the, main, the major causes for concern. Do you think, on that point, do you think Government needs to step in then in terms of national curriculum education within schools. Oh, without a doubt. Without Do you think that will happen more now? No. Do you, no? No. For what reason? Again, there's lack of individuals with lack of experiences in those influential positions. Um, as long as we have the white British face, the male face, the 60 year old plus face, um, governing how this country um, runs and governing how um, football and sports runs within, within, within England. The results are always going to be the same. Um, I'm still having conversations with individuals as to why the word coloured is unacceptable. That's because there's a particular demographic of individual who governs um, institutions within, the, within or just sports in general around the country. Until that changes, we're always going to face the same issue. Um, what we need is a change of, of, of diversity within leadership. Until that happens, it's going to be the same conveyor belt over and over again. I feel very lucky because I grew up in a very multicultural city yeah. in Birmingham yeah. and where I live now in Manchester, if you go to Goals or the local mm -hmm. community, uh, five aside, eight aside, yeah. you see a wide range of different types of uh, cultures and ethnicities playing football. I remember being, um, I went football the other week and I remember seeing Asian communities, Jewish communities yeah. all playing and it kind of hit me to think that actually I've never seen any of that community kind of progress into yeah. the elite level. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that's, why do you think that's an issue in terms of the progression into elite football? Which communities are we talking about specifically? Asian communities, for yeah. example. Even, yeah, so Asian communities, we'll use that as, a, as, a, as an example. Okay. In terms of representation at the top, yeah, yeah, because yeah. there's so many that play mm -hmm. football. Right. Why is there a limitation towards that? I just want to get your thoughts on, on that. I'm going to give a disclaimer first and my disclaimer will tie into my answer. Please, please do. I can never and never will I try to speak for the Asian community. Okay. Why? Because I'm not Asian. Um, yes, I'm an ethnic minority because of my skin colour, but I'll give you a very prime example. If we're talking about grassroots football, black people do not have a participation issue within grassroots football. Neither do black people have an issue um, developing through the academy system in abundance to find the most black individuals within the academy sector now. We fought years upon years to get to this point and now we are and we still got a lot to, to work on but in terms of numbers wise um, it's not an issue that we face. Participation and, and developing through and into and through the academy system is definitely an uh, issue that is exclusive to the Asian community. Um, and it's something that I've, I've never experienced because again, it's just not what, what the, the issues that the people who look like me, um, the issues that people who look like me face. 
Um, so I'll give that caveat again because I never want to do any communities disjustice by believing that I can speak for all. And the reasons why I had to give that as an initial disclaimer is because that's one of the reasons why um, the issue exists. Individuals group everybody together into thinking that grouping everybody together is going to provide answers to the issues. So somebody will look at an increase in black individuals in the academy sector and think, all right, we've got enough BAME individuals within the academy sector now. Here's the issue doesn't exist anymore. No, no, no. You have the B part of BAME as part of the, um, as part of the academy sector now. You've missed out the A. And this is what happens when you group people together, is you try to group people together with one solution. So you've addressed one very small part uh, in, as big as it may be integral, um, integrity wise, you've missed, you've, you've, you've addressed one issue, which is the B of the BAME and completely missed out the A. But because we bracket everybody now, we've, we seem to believe that the issue doesn't exist. Until football as a whole starts to address each underrepresented community group individually for whom they are, the issue will always exist. We're yet to collectively understand what issues the Asian community face, why they face it, and have influential people in position who have that experience in position to then influence the change. Um, and that only happens when we address the issues that Asian people face directly. Stop banding everybody together. And football's been so guilty of that by using this terminology, which I dis discredit to the core of BAME. The issues that black people face is completely different to the issues that Asian people face, but we address all of them the same way. Um, so that will be the number one thing for me, is football still as a whole still hasn't addressed the Asian issue. Um, there's so many stereotypical um, comebacks that I've heard in regards to Asian progression, such as, oh, when they reach 13 to 14 years old, they're still focused on their studies and GCSEs and parents don't see... Um, example is them on the TV, so they discourage their children. How do you know that? Have you asked the question? If so, whom have you asked? Is there influential position, people in position who have that experience to either approve or disapprove of that? There's so many stereotypes that have filtered down now, which, which has created a narrative that so many people run with, um, which has contributed as to why whenever we try to address this Asian issue, um, or the, the, sorry, the issues that the Asian community face, um, it's, it's being received as mediocre. We don't want tick box exercises here. We don't want conferences for the sake of conferences or roadshows for the sake of roadshows or media campaigns for the sake of media campaigns. All the things that have been done previously, where have they led to and what have been the results of that? Until we bring those tangible pieces of data and evidence to the table, the Asian community are well within their right to say this is tokenistic and that's often the response that we see whenever there are Asian inclusion or Asian action plans in place. It's okay, we've been here before, what's different this time? Um, football needs to be very specific with the issues that they address now. This idea of banding everybody together in one box has to stop um, because that for me at this point is just a blatant form of disrespect. Disrespect to those who are not heard um, and a disrespect to the people um, who are fought and, and really sacrifice their health and their lives to get to this point of trying to get their communities to a point of being heard. Um, and when football isn't listening at that point, again, we just revert back to the dictatorship and this is where we are. How do we change that then, in terms of that banding everyone together? Can we change that? Yeah. Is there methods of doing that? Yeah, I think there's methods of doing that, but only comes with leadership. Um, leadership has to change. So yes, we know there's no room for racism. Yes, we know that, um, that we have to show racism red card. Yes, we know we have to kick it out. But when we're breaking down the, 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 um, the structure of what that actually looks like and putting actions um, to, to those themes, what does the actions look like? Who are we involving in the actions? What does the demographics of the leadership look like? Again, it always boils down to leadership um, and the strategies that are put in place, but more so you putting money where your mouth is. Um, again, we've had a lot of lip service, man. A lot of lip service. And again, the t-shirts look great and the banners look great and the adverts on Sky look great and, and the, the PR that we do on, on social media looks great and all this stuff that looks great, but 
it doesn't translate to what's actually happening on a day-to-day basis. Um, and that's why I just use the term, we've got to start putting our money where our mouth is. You mentioned people in leadership. So, the Rooney Rule. I want your opinions on that, the Rooney Rule. Is it effective? Is it not? Is it needed? Is it not? I'm never going to be of the opinion that somebody should be afforded an opportunity because of the colour of their skin. Um, people who aren't right white British are very qualified, invaluable experiences and can bring more than enough to the table without this, the colour of their skin being a factor here. The issue is, is why aren't they being afforded the opportunities? And I always boil it down to the fact that the people looking at the applications are still heavily white British. So when we're talking about institutional racism and how that manifests, it still manifests in an intangible way that those of us on the receiving end of it know what it looks like. But when we point the finger, it's, oh, you're, you're drawing for the, ra- for the race card. Um, so again, it for me, it boils down of what leadership looks like. Um, we have to have diversity in our leadership for the right reasons. It's very easy, very easy to have a black or an Asian person in position who's the wrong black or Asian person. Um, and that's for me, is one of the downfalls of the Rooney Rule is, yes, you fill the quota um, for diversity, but it doesn't mean you have the right person in place. Um, and for me, having uh, uh, a, a um, employment procedure on the grounds of what somebody looks like is a complete discreditation to what they bring to the table. Um, nobody can ever tell me that black and Asian people are not qualified, don't have the degrees if that's what you're looking for, don't have the bachelors, don't have the doctorates or the experiences, where it all it be life or work experience, it's probably more invaluable than anybody else. But why is it the application process isn't as um, vigorous and open as, as it should be? Mm-hmm. That for me is a leadership issue. Um, so again, there's a piercing of the leadership that needs to take place, that just needs to take place, but that can't happen, in my opinion, through processes such as the Rooney Rule, because again, what I bring to the table has got nothing to do with the color of my skin. I would hate to believe I'm in position where I am now because I'm black. Um, I'd like to think it's because of what I bring to the table. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't agree with it, but um, it's to throw some positivity in there. The conversation around it shows that some people understand that there's an issue that needs to be addressed. It's just the, the way we're going out addressing those issues aren't necessarily the most um, morally pure. You said throw some positivity, yeah. so you're going to throw a little bit more in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me about some good work that you've done over your time uh, as grassroots manager. Yeah, so <coughs> again, it's, it's, so, it's, so, um, it's a two-edged sword because we're doing so much work, um, but a lot of the work that we do is behind the scenes and can't be proven. So one of the main questions that a lot of people will have of Kick It Out is, oh, what do you do? You guys just do nothing. The times when I'm on the train at... 12 o'clock at night time, 11.30, getting home at one o'clock in the morning because I'm delivering workshops to a board who are still predominantly white British and 60 plus years old. For me, something that we can't market. Mm-hmm. Um, but these are the works that are going on behind the scenes. We're doing um, player engagement workshops at academies, telling people how to um, apply themselves in the academy sectors, how to speak up if you're discriminated against in the academy sector. We're doing so much from a, a county of faith standpoint, from an FA standpoint, from a, an academy standpoint, from a, a mentorship standpoint. Um, and that's just in terms of community and people engagement. What we're trying to do now is, is, is position ourselves to, to increase our resources, whether that be increasing the amount of employees we have within the organisation or increasing the amount of resources that we then distribute to local communities for them to do what they are already good at. Um, that's where, for me, the real, the, where the real, the real impact is. Um, again, like I said, we've delivered over 120 workshops face-to-face like, um, or online between two people around the entire country. A lot of people still have this misconception of kicking out and to believe in that we have offices everywhere and the phones are ringing off and is robots answering emails. We are a very small charity with under 20 people catering for the entire country um, across all levels of football. That is a very, very big piece of work. Um, so considering the lack of resources that we have, um, a lot of us who are on the ground doing work are spreading ourselves very, very thinly. Um, 
in terms of just the time that we have within the working day. A lot of us go above and beyond. I wake up in the, in the morning, the first thing I'm doing is checking emails. I go to bed at night time. The, the last thing I'm doing is writing up a presentation or a, a proposal or an educational resource. Um, so there's a lot of early mornings and a lot of late nights that, again, you just can't explain to people. And to be honest with you, we, we shouldn't have to because we're not doing it to shine a light on Kick It Out. We're not doing it to, um, to expand our brand. We're not doing it to... Um, to gain more followers, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and those of us who are deliverers or on the ground, we're doing it because number one of our experiences, and number two, it's so important that whilst we are in position to be around the table with the FA and county FAs and the Premier League and the EFL and the PFA, it's so important that we act as an accurate depiction of the needs of the communities and the individuals who we're serving. Um, so in a very tight nutshell, man, is a lot of work that we do in behind the scenes. Um, a lot of sleepless nights um, between us, a lot of um, early mornings. Um, but again, these are just behind the scenes things that we do to fight people's corners. If we get a discrimination case and it hasn't been handled adequately by County FA, guess who's onto that? Kick it out. We can't prove that and it's not our job to prove that. It's our job to just continue to serve our communities to make sure that their outcomes are just to make sure that they're served the way they should be served. Um, so for me, um, a very political, but some people may see it as political answer, but for me, it's just making sure that we're serving the communities the way that we should be, but not neglecting the fact that we do need an increase in resources to make sure that we're, we're seen more. Um, I've always been of the opinion um, that banners will always have lim limitations. T-shirts that we've been known for will always have the limitations. Um, but it's the behind the scenes work that we do has, that has the most impact. But again, that's the work that's just not seen um, and rightfully so, because it's, but that's why they call it behind the scenes. So very political answer, but that's what we do. You know? Tell me if I'm wrong. Is it hard to quantify your work because of the element of educating others and seeing maybe, say for example, it was racism and people were maybe fearful of talking about that incident or yeah. not really educated to understand that was racism yeah. and it kind of gets brushed under the carpet a little bit. Do you feel like sometimes your work can be challenging to kind of measure in mm. terms of that element of quantifying how many issues around yeah, race yeah, happens, yeah, yeah, yeah. if that makes sense? No, 100%. From a publicity standpoint, in terms of informing the general public, 100%. Um, and that's the reasons why the narrative around Kick It Out still is what you guys do. Um, we do have to quantify our work to appease our, our funders. Um, so it's important that we can quantify our work um, in some respect, just to make sure that they are aware of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but in terms of how that translates to the general public and informing them on what we do, um, for me is, is where the hard work continues to be. The need is so strong. Um, and the need is, 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 is ever growing. People are going to continue to be discriminated against, um, both in the communities, the grassroots, all the way through to the pro game and in between. Um, the issue is the amount of work that we do um, and the, uh, the, the amount that, that that work is translated to the public will never really be enough because the need is always going to exceed what we can bring to the table as long as the resources stay the way they are. Um, so even if we increase our public presence in terms of uh, how informative we are, um, the need will always exceed that because of the way society is within England at the moment. So it's literally sometimes like filling water into a bucket with a hole in the middle um, because again, number one, the need will always be um, greater than the work that we do, but also um, we don't do it to, to speak about why we do what we do and why we do, we do it again because it's the right thing to do um, and, we're, and we're fortunate enough to be in a very influential position to do so. So one question I wanted to ask was about taking the knee because I think it's publicised a lot yeah. in, in, in the media at the moment, yeah. especially in the Premier League. And I know your role is grassroots, um, but we, we all kind of are exposed to the elite level. It's something that we all live for for the weekend as a spectator and, and a watcher. Um, what are your thoughts on taking the knee and some of the implications that have been put in place recently? Taking the knee is a very interesting one because... Initially, it had it somewhat had an impact um, because again, it was something that nobody had ever seen before. My issue with taking the knee is 
it became the thing rather than the thing that invokes the conversation to provoke some change. Um, the fact that taking a knee in itself has become the talking point for me. We've, we've deviated from, from what the original intent was. And the original intent was, was to show um, through some type of um, public gesture that there are in, in, inequalities in, not just in football, but around the world. Because again, it originated from the NFL. So it's not a, a football exclusive thing. But it has now taken over to become an entity in itself, um, which for me is a distraction to um, what its origins were meant to play a part in in the first place. I will never ever discourage anybody from taking a knee. Um, and if people need encouragement, then great. But my thing is, it has to be a tool. It can't be the thing. We're not taking a knee just for the sake of taking a knee. We're taking a knee in hopes that it would lead to um, and if it isn't leading to anywhere, at that point we'll need to question its existence. It's amazing from the standpoint of if a 10-year-old has gone to a football game and they see a footballer going on one knee before the game, they will ask the question, why? Um, and at that point the conversation is to be had, which is amazing. Um, and I, I think you have to be a pretty crappy human being to question that in itself in terms of its impact. But... The reality is conversation isn't enough to way change the way football is governed within this country. Um, there needs to be action. Um, there needs to be questions asked, which leads to action. Action needs to lead to strategy, and strategy needs to, to lead to results. Um, we yet to see the results. So we're two years into taking a knee now, um, and we're still having the conversation around taking a knee, which for me defeats the whole object. Um, if that conversation isn't evolving to things changing at a boardroom level, at that point, um, enough. It is enough. Do you think it's covering the cracks then? I wouldn't say it's covering the cracks because I would say in a lot of ways it's exposing some cracks. Because again, if you're yeah. ignorant to what's happening in society and what's happening to black and Asian footballers, taking a knee will definitely spark some type of conversation which may not have existed in any other circumstance. Um, but what I will say is, is it's taken in an ident identity of itself, which is overlooking the issue. And the issue is people are still being discriminated against. Um, governance still isn't fully protected people from underrepresented groups. There's still institutional racism within the, within the academy sector and beyond. These are conversations which, which had, which initially should have been had, um, two years in, there's no way we're two years into any type of um, conversation and results aren't being brought to the table. That to me is unacceptable for any industry. Um, so I will never ever discredit taking the knee. Um, if people feel led to take the knee continue to, to continue to, then great, because again, it invokes a conversation. If people stop, I fully understand. My thing is, it cannot be the thing. Um, and unfortunately, you see it creeping in to become the thing. Um, which again, for me, isn't again, so I'll turn it back, isn't covering any cracks, but it's more so um, overlooking its original intent. And that's the, the concerning thing for me, is you can't overlook the reasons of its origins. What do you think of those that refuse to take the knee? And then there's, there was occasions where people booed taking the knee. Yeah. What are your opinions on that? The people who refuse to take the knee, I will, you cannot discredit them because they, they're refusing to take the knee for, for the most part, um, the, the individuals who are refusing to take the knee because they're seeing a lack of change. Um, and you can't discredit that. It's the, the proof's in the pudding. A lot of things are still the same. So if they refuse to, to do a gesture because they feel that the gesture it hasn't ha doesn't have any impact, you are well within your right to stand up on, on that stance. <laughs> for those who boo the knee, on the other hand, um, for me is an open declaration as to where you stand. Yes, there are political elements that are tied to the, the movement of Black Lives Matter and all that stuff, but the reality is there is an issue which has played and affected black people for decades. That's, that's got nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. If we had changed the, the narrative and rebranded it as um, Black Lives Exist, would you still boo the knee? Because at that point, it's not tied to a, what you class as a political organisation. It's just something that's a reality. Black lives do exist. Can we act like it does, please? Not just black lives, but Asian lives and Latin lives and all the other underrepresented groups. Um, you are booing the, when you boo Black Lives Matter, in essence, you are booing 
what people would deem as a political party. At that point, you've taken it from here to completely somewhere else. So again, the result is we've deviated away from the original intent. How could you choose to focus on the political party over the fact that black people who give you the entertainment of, of consuming football every week are going through some really bad conditions at work? Um, so again, the booing for me just signified where we are as a society. Um, a lot of some people choose to address the, and support the issues that we face and some others choose to use their voices to, um, again, overlook the issues and place that on areas which for us aren't important. Um, so yes, it's two different stances. Social media is a massive tool now. Um, we had incidents last year during the Euros um, and I know we kind of look at it from an elite perspective. Mm -hmm. I presume in grassroots we do have issues around discrimination online. We're very quick to, to highlight when a, f a professional player is abused on social media. Um, or All the professional player needs to do is send out a tweet with a screenshot of the abuse they've received and the whole world goes into a frenzy for 24 hours and then they move on again. Grassroots players go through that every week. Um, but because they're not a, a national figure, because they haven't got a blue tick next to their Twitter handle, um, nobody cares. Um, which goes back to what I was saying previously in regards to foot, grassroots football or the grassroots sector just being the most ungoverned sector of, of, um, of the football pyramid. Um, this issue of social media abuse for me goes beyond football um, and it's a social media issue in general. Um, and if the individuals who um, run these, these social media companies don't put policies in place um, and, are in a, and allow that to be at all, force the importance of that being in alignment with law um, they're the ones doing a disjustice to the, the people on the receiving end we do say all the time that that hate crime is against the law and if you want to report it to the police you can why on earth is that not translated to social media um, that's for me because the guidelines around how these social um, media companies um, are, are portrayed is you can get away with it because nothing much will happen if you if you do it um, unless it's a public figure um, is Marcus Rashford any more or less important than, than um, Marcus Albert round the corner? Two Marcuses, it's just one's got a blue tick, the one's famous and one isn't. They may have the same type of abuse, it's just one's got attention and is acted upon swiftly, as, as swiftly as, as, well not swiftly as it should be, but it's still acted upon. And the other Marcus isn't because he's not famous, he doesn't have a blue tick. Again, it's just a reflection of how grassroots is in general. Um, so from that perspective, it has to boil down to us holding social media companies to account. There's so many aspects in which we are, such as the online safety bill, um, and definitely having meetings with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok directly to let them understand the error in their ways or their, their shortfalls. But again, for me, it just boils down to leadership. Do you have individuals in place who knows what it feels like to be on the receiving end of this? Do they have family members who knows what it feels like to be on the receiving end of it? If they don't, you're relying on empathy how much uh, education are you investing in your empathy to let you fully understand the, the magnitude of this issue? I'd question that. So if I'm a grassroots coach yeah. or I, if I'm serving the community, as you, you've alluded to throughout, what kind of things can we put in place to maybe eradicate some of these issues? You mentioned social media and maybe issues that might happen on the pitch as well as off the pitch. What kind of things should I be trying to include in my maybe my coaching philosophy or my leadership within a, a football club yeah. is there anything that you think that is, is is relevant to prevent the issues of racism but other forms of mm. discrimination as well one thing i would say is as a as a coach you need to to have an understanding of your area know the demographics of your area know the the moral makeup of your area whether it be sexual orientation race religion um, gender, that all, all, all of the elements that make up characteristics, you need to know what your area looks like. I've delivered far too many um, um, workshops where individuals who are based in, in more rural parts of the, the country are so fixated on racism. I'm like, why are you fixated on racism? You don't have the luxury of diversity. If the majority of the individuals within your team or your club, excuse me, are white British, don't focus on race. There may be a large amount of LGBT individuals within your community. There may be a large array of women that you're neglecting. There may be um, a large amount of elderly people, which again is a characteristic people don't speak about enough, or disability. You have to know your area. And when you know your area, you'll know how to cater for them. 
um, which again specifies where you put your energy. When we're trying to do the, the moral thing and trying to address all forms of discrimination, it's, it's impossible. It's imp no one organization around the world can um, eradicate or help to contribute to eradicating all forms of discrimination. I kick it out, we try, but it's a very, very hard task. Um, you need to specify where you put your energy. Um, so the first thing I would say is to know your area and that will allow you to specify where you put your energy. If you're in a particular part of the country and again there's a large um, female population, focus on the experiences of women within football. If it's the LGBT community, focus on the LGBT experience. That will then allow you to fine tune how your club approaches what is the larger demographic of your area. Um, and you'll find your, your, your impact will will probably be more beneficial in that way because you're tailoring towards the specific community. Um, so that'll be the first thing. The second thing is, is, is make sure you're fully aware of FA procedures and processes. Um, every corner of it. So that when incidents do happen, you know what your rights are, you know what procedures to follow, um, and you know how to safeguard the individuals within your care. Um, and finally, um, educate yourself. Um, Whilst you may have a particular niche that you're catering for in accordance to the demographics of your area, having a very foundational understanding of what just EDI and discrimination um, requires of you as a human being will go a very long way. Um, there's so many resources out there that you can educate yourself across the board. Um, and for me, it's just a sign of laziness if somebody turns around and says they didn't know. The information is there. We're in the era of millennials now, we're Generation Z now, where we, we're sport for choice when it comes to education and resources use them um, and if you can't find any ask somebody the question who will be able to, be able to direct you to where the information is um, and understand that your role as a um, football coach isn't limited to football you <laughs> I, I, can't, I cannot stand it when people say oh it's not a, it's not a football issue it's a society issue mm -hmm. football plays such an integral part of society you cannot separate the two mm -hmm. because your football coach is your local police officer, your football coach is your, um, your local politician, your football parent is your local school teacher, head teacher, it all intertwines, you cannot separate the two. Um, so we have a moral duty as a human being to be the best that we can into making sure that we understand in everybody's experiences to the best of our ability, but it only comes when you educate yourself. Um, so I'll utilize the information that we have at our, at our disposal for free. Um, so those would be the three elements that I would encourage coaches to um, to, to in, in, engage in immediately but it's just again I, it's understanding that it's never just the football coach you're a dad figure you're a mum figure you're a big brother a big sister you're a, a mentor um, it goes far beyond football and you should take it that, that, that responsibility very seriously I would say there's, there's two strands of information that you have access to you have access to formal education and informal education I class formal education as a direct link to policies and procedures and things that's required of you in a particular role at that point there's, there's a, a large array of, of um, courses that the FA provide in regards to what you should do Kick It Out provides a large amount of, of resources in regards to how to handle discrimination um, there's safeguarding courses from various bespoke organisations or individual organisations around the country. Um, so in terms of formal education, there's so many organisations you can provide a structured form of education, whether it be a workshop or an online module or a real life education resource or course. Um, and I just say to go to your local sporting bodies or kick it out or show races of the red card or any of the formal organisations you know are in position, they, they, they will provide the formal education that you need. The informal side of things is, as you said, is more opinion-led. If, you if you're not an avid reader, listen to a podcast. If you're not a listener, watch a podcast. If you're not either of those things, have conversations with people who have had those experiences. Um, so those are two strands of, of education that I believe you need the balance of. You need to know what procedures to follow um, in terms of if you're in position and, and there's a requirement of your role. But also as a human being, it's just consuming information. Listening to this podcast, people may not, um, don't, nothing that we're saying is, is factual. It's my experiences, it's your experiences. We're having a conversation, but it's opening your ears to the conversation to then enlighten you to a different perspective. Um, that's the important part of the, the informal side of things is open your horizons. What is it like to be a Sikh individual in England? What is it like to be a, a Southeast Asian within England? What is it like to be 
black and, and, and living in, in, um, in Norfolk, which is predominantly white British? What is it like to be a female in a heavily football male dominated industry? What is it like to have a disability and not have access to certain things that you feel that you rightfully should have access to? This is where the informality is coming in terms of podcasts and books and interviews and, and radio conversations and stuff. It's just opening your perspective. And one of the things that I believe football has been so guilty of, um, and just probably British society in general, is a very narrow-minded way of, of, of thinking. Um, and that's the reasons why I believe that the younger generations um, embrace diversity more because they have access to, to, to more means of, of, um, of perspective. Um, again, if I, if I have a conversation with somebody who's 60 plus years old and is, is, is a white British male, they won't have any um, issues with, with using the word coloured or half caste or describing female football in a particular way. Because in terms of the information they consumed in a particular period in time, that's what, was, that's what the narrative was. Whereas millennials and Generation Z, etc., we have so much information at our disposal. You have no excuse to not expose yourself to another way of thinking or another way of life or to understand another life experience. Um, so, yeah, that's the, my long way of saying there's two strands of information, formal and informal, and you have to have a balance of the two. Final question, yep. Taijan. That went quickly, boy. Jeez. <laughs> What we normally do is we normally get our guests to look back at their career. Okay. But I'm going to get you to look forward. Okay, yeah. So the day you come to the end uh, in terms of your position, yeah. um, grassroots manager, whatever it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously yeah. in this area, what do you think your legacy would be? That's a beautiful question. Um, my legacy would be um, creating a space where individuals can feel comfortable being themselves in a boardroom setting. Um, there's been far too many examples where individuals from unrepresented groups get into position and they end up conforming themselves to a way of speaking or um, a way of dressing to appease the people who pay their paychecks. At that point, you've completely diluted the experience that needed to be brought to the table. Um, so my legacy for me is, and anybody will tell you from an FA perspective, from a county FA perspective, from uh, a local authority perspective, when Tejan Hutton comes to a room, Tejan Hutton is in himself. Um, I have no issues at all um, telling anybody when I think they're in the wrong, because my thing is um, being an accurate depiction and an accurate reflection of what underrepresented communities need. Um, and if I'm not bringing that narrative to the table, I'm robbing them and I'm robbing myself and I'm robbing the position that I'm in. There's a, a free seat at a table that I have, that I occupy. If I'm not using that and having an impact um, whenever, I, whenever I do sit on that seat to make sure that a different, again, different perspective is being brought to the table, I'm wasting an opportunity. Um, and I want my legacy to be, um, people in influential positions being comfortable being around individuals like me. Um, I'm not here to point the finger at anybody. I'm not here to make anybody um, feel bad. Um, and if that is the result of, of how I vocalise my opinions and my experiences, then fine, but I always back it up with actions. We are here now, but this is what I believe it takes to get to here. Um, and if I can provide an environment or facilitate and also play a very small integral role in contributing to an environment where that seat at the table is always reserved for somebody like me or somebody um, who somewhat looks or comes from my experiences, then my job is done. Um, what I'm doing in my, my position is just opening a door that's already been cracked for me. There's people who've come before me who's knocked at the door and have passed away, knocked some more and passed away, then the door cracks, then they've passed away, then the doors open a little bit further and a little bit further. My job is to just open the door a little bit more, a little bit more, or as much as I physically and possibly can, so that the person who's in the seat after me um, has more breathing space to walk into the room. Uh, and that's, that's where I see my legacy to be. 
Tejan, thank you so much. Where oh, can we okay. where can we connect with you? So any listeners um, wanna maybe connect with you I'm or not find a little bit more guy yeah. at all, man, but I'm somewhat ad hoc on Twitter every now and again. Um <laughs> I don't have Instagram, my, my Facebook is dormant. So yeah, you can probably find me on Twitter any, every now and again if I've got something to rant about my United. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my main means of contact. Or just use one of my work email addresses. That's, that's, that's all we can, we can touch base the best. Put your uh, Instagram yeah, in the yeah, description. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Twitter, Twitter. No Instagram for me, man. No Instagram for me. Man. Thank you so much, yeah. mate. Oh, Cheers. Pleasure, Thank, you. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.